Well, hello there. Welcome to Insuring Your Well-Being. I am Dennis James, the biking, dancing insurance man with various insurance planning. And today we're going to have a great topic that everybody needs to be aware and conscious of. And I have an expert. Her name is Deborah Ross. And uh, welcome, Deb. Thanks, Dennis. Glad to be here. Yes, glad you're here. Uh, We are going to really, you know, I just love this topic because just me being in the insurance profession, understanding, you know, uh, how many people are caregivers and and how Alzheimer's, uh, you know, really affects family and without the support and the expertise of people like you that can educate people that are listening or you know, they could be a caregiver. If they're not today, they may be tomorrow, right? And all the effects it has uh, and why uh, you are going to educate people on how they can get the support they need. And so, first of all, I just know you have an amazing background with th- over 30 years uh, at, as with dementia and you've done certifications not only with the Alzheimer's Association of Michigan, and I understand this is all national, but just spend a few minutes and just tell us a little bit how you got involved in that and um, your background. Oh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, First of all, it's my passion. I really have a drive to help others understand this is a, a long journey for someone to be a caregiver or living with Alzheimer's and related dementia. So my background has been with Well Senior Community Education, and I had an opportunity to really drill down to specific needs. And so I embraced the field of dementia education, dementia care. And I've been with the Alzheimer's Association over two decades now. And as a volunteer, I find it extremely rewarding to be able to provide support group facilitation as well as educational programs. And it ties into being person-centered as our communities provide memory care all across the state. We're able to impact how they train their staff and how they can have a better quality of life for their residents. Sure. I, uh, you know, just being in the industry of insurance with long-term care insurance, right? And it seems like there's a lot more, um, you know, memory care facilities that there has been in the past, or is that, or is that not true? Oh, I, definitely true. There is um, a need to provide a village approach to caring for individuals that can no longer stay at home, and I know that's everyone's wish that they want them to stay in their own environment. But you know, at some point in time, the caregivers really need a good night's sleep and this it's very hard to be awake 24 hours a day seven days a week and wear all those hats of safety and meals and entertainment and oversight and just activities of daily living you know the dressing feeding bathing that go along with the decline of the person over time yeah it's right it's the yeah, it's interesting, the activities of daily living, which, right, it always usually starts with cognitive, but how it affects everything else, including yes. it can a- affect death and other types of um, things that um, make it tough on caregivers and that particular recipient, recipient also. You know, uh, it always becomes a question as far as um, the developing Alzheimer's part of normal aging. Uh, you know, just how do you feel about that and what's, what's kind of, you know, out there uh, what people would uh, want to understand about that? Well, that one's a good one, Dennis, because it's not part of normal aging. No matter how old you get, the expectation should not be that you develop brain disease and that you lose your sense of self. Age is the biggest risk factor because the longer we live, the chances of developing a form Mm -hmm. of dementia is ever present, but it's not an expectation. And I don't want folks to think that as they get older, the, the faultiness of their memory 
is only one aspect of what this these diseases can actually do to a person's quality of life. You know, it's your ability to to take care of yourself, your ability to plan ahead and enjoy the moments, not just trying to remember. It's much, much more than that. Yeah, for sure. I um, I was listening to a, uh, you know, webinar early this morning. They were talking about, uh, you know, both these ladies. They worked for a community which would have been, you know, with the assisted living, the nursing, memory care. And, and the topic was um, more where it's shifting as as important with medical, right, working with them on things, but being them being as individualized as they can be, Correct. right? Um, not only for them, but for, you know, any kind of, the family members too. And I, you know, I just thought it made, made impact, right? Cause nobody wants to lose that. No, it's a, what we call the, the long goodbye because those that are caring for individuals bear witness every day. And it comes to the point in their disease process where that is irrelevant to the person living with the disease because they become, their world becomes very small, but those that are caring and providing that quality of care, bear witness. And it's, it's, it's a hard journey to be on. And if we can help give you that kind of direction and support, our, our belief at the Alzheimer's Association is that no one should feel alone on this journey. And we have various resources and a helpline that is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week with individuals that can provide that ear, that guidance, those referrals, and right. identify resources so that we can help. Right, I know they have somebody that uh, right in this Orient Center where we're right next door to us, uh, they have somebody that is with Corwell Hospitals, right? And they have somebody that is always over there. I believe they do weekly, uh, you know, where there are support groups and that type of thing and education, so... It's so cool. And then people that are living, right, not only in Michigan, but it's uh, this is a, a, U, a U.S. national, uh, the Alzheimer's? Yes, we are nationwide. So if you call our 800 number, I'll give it out right now. Sure. 1-800-272-3900. That's across the nation. And you may have loved ones that you are concerned about, or maybe you're caring long distance for a loved one in another state. And bridges the gap so you can inquire about a particular demographic where an individual may be living and link up with resources and support groups that are in that area. Very cool. And all right, so, you know, a lot of people have a question and reference the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. Ah, that's the the age-old question. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Testing, testing. Yeah. (laughs) So if I can simplify it, for folks. Thank you. Because many will say, um, my, my loved one had dementia and it turned into Alzheimer's. And while it sounds like they're two different factors, they're not. Dementia is the signs or are the signs and symptoms that your brain's not working right. And it can be a malfunction of speech or ex- sequencing, you know, being able to put your clothes on in order or following a recipe, paying your bills, navigating your body. Your balance is part Mm -hmm. of that too. So when we start to see subtle changes due to dementia, we want to ask the question, what's the cause? What's causing these symptoms? And for about 70% of the time, Alzheimer's disease is the cause of the dementia symptoms. Now, there are over 100 types of dementia an individual may be diagnosed with, but our focus, for the most part, is the popularity of the disease diagnosis. It is most prevalent, but that doesn't negate all the other dementias that affect a person's ability to be whole. Mm -hmm. I hope that adds some clarity. Yeah. You know, I, I was just thinking of somebody, and everybody knows him, is... I just feel like I want to talk about it just briefly. Bruce Willis. Yes. Yeah. Can you uh, just kind of 
I, I'd like your viewpoint on that. I know it, it's come on and it's been really, you know, it's very challenging. It could be one of the challenger and more challenging ones when it comes to dementia and that type. You know, when we have celebrities that come forward with yeah. dementia-related disease or any disease at all, it, it puts the spotlight on yeah. the the disease, but also on the symptoms and the debilities that yeah. a, a person of notoriety is facing. We saw the same thing with Michael J. Fox. So as we witness as privately as they can be with their diagnosis for Bruce and his progression, um, we want to be sensitive to the fact that it does take away your ability to be who you are. And with Bruce, his ability to speak, it really has affected his language center to the point where you know, it, it can rob a person of all speech and, and then the comprehension of speech as well. So it's a full circle. And we, we really wish he and his family all the best support ever Absolutely. as he journeys forward. Yep. So what would you say the greatest risk is? And I'm sure there's plenty of them, but... Oh, well, <laughs> the greatest risk is age, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. But we can't factor out your family history. We can't factor out genetics because they all contribute to who we are. And it, it, it's our, our, our legacy. But for many people, they don't always know their family <coughs> history. You know, perhaps had their ancestors lived out a full life and maybe not died in a war or from some plague, we would have been able to have a better tracking record. We were doing better now. But we have genetic testing available. In fact, with our new drug that has hit the market, and it shows such great, great promise. Uh, the drug is called Denanumab or Kisunla, K-I-S-U-N-L-A. And it's for early stage Alzheimer's disease. But we take a look at genetics. And so having a, uh, a diagnosis of your genes and looking for biomarkers and the traditional genes that indicate that there's a probable versus a possible allows a person to qualify for these treatments. So genetic testing, family history, and age are the three primary factors that we really look closely at. Mm-hmm. You know, I know a lot of people are becoming a lot more conscious um, today than they have been in the past. Um, and that comes down to what we would say nutrition, right? So when it comes to processed foods and um it could be alcohol, smoking, drugs, all those things, mm-hmm. where it, um, over a period of time, right, there's, and I, I know there's proof that they're starting to realize with markers also that it can affect the progression when it comes to dementia. And I, what's your thought on that? I, I had heard something on that. I read things. Doesn't mean it's always the answer. I would say your expertise a lot, <laughs> way over and above what I'm saying. I'm just going based off what I heard, and I do believe in wellness a lot, and I just feel it's so important, nutrition, good nutrition. Oh, and you say good nutrition, and I love the fact that you didn't use the word diet. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association, in cooperation with the uh, Food and Drug Administration mm-hmm. and the CDC, we have put together a a chart of 10 healthy habits for your brain and <coughs> your brain needs the same kind of flu fuel that your body does and what sure. you put into your body is what yeah. has to be processed and we have choices and certainly if we can reduce the the intake of processed foods because you have no yeah. control as to what's in those foods they just guarantee to make them taste good so you buy yeah. more yeah. but you know, our planet provides us with everything that we need. And if we can make healthy choices along the way, and that's just one part of it, Dennis, we really need to look at getting a good night's sleep. Absolutely. It gives your yeah. brain a chance to yeah. take out the trash and, and right. focus on rejuvenation so we can start another day again. But the 10 healthy habits are choices that all of us can make and start today. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, I would encourage everyone to go to our website, alz.org, 
and type in healthy brain and you'll be able to get lots of information. Yeah, so um, since we're talking about that, um, also, right, what we do when it comes to activity is called fitness, right? It's called moving, moving your body. Yes. It's called walking is probably one of the greatest, best things people can do, yes. right? Because this is our brain up here. So if this is our brain up here, right, if we want to help, uh, in any way, our whole body, but our brain, mm -hmm. right? Getting the blood pumped up through there, that's where that, where you get your heartbeat going, it's gonna get that blood circulating, including up, right? So that's where you want to be able to get that heart rate up, you wanna get the blood flowing, uh, whatever that exercise, what we would call exercise, right? Uh, getting that heartbeat up to 60% plus, you obviously got to follow your doctor, listen to your body, but at the same time, if you're not doing that, you know, it's it's not going to help you in any way, right, when it comes to staying, uh, in, improving your lifestyle or at least maintaining your lifestyle. And so um, it's, you know, so it becomes the nutrition, it becomes the, uh, the fitness activity, it becomes the social activity, and the spiritual activity. All those things come into a, a role when it comes to using this mind, body, and spirit. And um, so um, that was just my little two cents I wanted to throw in there because it kind of weighs on my heart, right? Because um, everybody needs to, it's never too late. It's only too late when you don't do something about it. That's correct. And I think you gave everybody a whole quarter, not two cents. That was a lot of information. And I'm hoping that those that are listening may say, oh, I, I, I can't move or um, I have restrictions. Always talk with your physician yeah. or your team and right. find out what you can do. And the key to all of that, Dennis, and I'm sure you being the biker and the dancer uh, and other uh, physical activities, is to find something that you love. There you and go. if you yeah. enjoy it, then you're yeah. going to do it more often. So yeah. those are questions you can ask yourself. What haven't I tried? What could be enjoyable for me? And how can I grow it? And when you talk about sociability... When you have somebody that's joining you on that walk or that adventure in learning something new, th then you're sharing and you can become cheerleaders for each other. So there you go. lots of good things. Yeah, you just shake that body, right? Da, da, da. Yeah. <laughs> you can do that in a chair too, yes. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yep. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. Sure. Anyhow, um, all right, so younger individuals developing, uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease and what age. I mean, you know, I think that can be pretty much all over the board. But do you have, like, somebody that, I mean, who's been the youngest? And, you know, I, 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 I would find that interesting for people to know. Yeah, the sad statistics of this. This is an age-old disease discovered back in 1906. And Dr. Alzheimer's first, first patient, the first woman that he encountered and was, you know, just baffled by her decline. And when he met her, she was 51. And when we think about individuals today at 51, that's young. It's a young onset of this mm -hmm. disease. She died three years later. So it mm. wasn't like she, she had been newly diagnosed wow. or she was in the beginning stages. Yeah. She was towards the end of her journey. So if we think about signs and symptoms that start to creep up, or even asymptomatic, nothing that we can pick up on, that can be 20 years prior. Yeah. So right. younger individuals yeah. are still susceptible to the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, other dementias, such as frontal temporal dementia, uh, which is a, a classification of its own. And yet, we can't discount the fact that because we have a younger onset of individuals that it's age related and that certainly negates that that fact so we want to keep our our stigma open so that we are considering the deficits and the fallouts for individuals who may have young children or still paying off college loans and trying to apply a plan for retirement and now they are debilitated with the same old disease 
as someone who's in their late 80s. So it's devastating. And while it's not as prevalent as our, our other older or later stage dementias, uh, it's still a fact. Right, and you were talking about, um, you know, the advantage of the early diagnosis. Yes, yes, yes. When we are able to identify individuals at the onset, and we're getting close to that, um, very soon we'll have a blood test that you can have in your doctor's office, and they can look at the biomarkers that indicate Alzheimer's disease. I mean, certainly we have our, our, our PET scans. We have our uh, spinal fluid tap. Yeah. There are other in more invasive methods to test, but we can be about 95% accurate in a simple blood test. And if we wow. can detect individuals as part of your wellness, your annual wellness, yeah. imagine seeing those markers and there's no indication. And to have the onset of new medications that can stall or prolong this disease from progressing. And that's where we are today. I am so excited and can't wait to see what we're going to have coming forward. Yeah, you know, I I guess once we uh, cure this disease, Deb, then what's the next step for you? (laughs) Ah, I will go around and celebrate. There you go. (laughs) With everyone. (laughs) That'll be the fun part of my journey. Yep, there you go. You know, what can we do now to ensure a healthy brain? I know we talked a little bit about it. Um, Do you have any other thoughts on that? Yes, I do. Um, We live in a great state. We live in a great country where we have choices. Not everybody is privileged to have choices. And if we can make little changes in our life, well, you talked about exercise, you talked about balanced diet or nutrition Mm -hmm. and we talked about sociability and that mind body spirit if we can make small changes along the way starting now imagine what it would be like for our little ones if we started with a great regime from from inception and grow those habits so that their chances of fighting off alzheimer's disease or other dementias may put them at you know, a very low risk and building our future forward. So think about changes. Think about reducing stress. My mantra is pick your battles. And if it's not a battle worth fighting for, can we take a deep breath and let go? And mm-hmm. really see if we can make a difference every single day in the quality of your own life just by simple changes. Yeah, the simple changes can be great examples for others also. Absolutely. Right? You know, you're either... Um, yeah. Those individuals that are newly diagnosed and we can have interventions early on, it gives that person a chance to still have their voice <coughs> and still make decisions <coughs> along with their, their care partner. Their, when I say care partner, it's the person that's shoulder to shoulder with them at, at the beginning. They're not caregiving, but they're supportive. And you can have input about finances and legal decisions and patient advocates. So they can be heard, and it really helps families when the decisions are already made and honored. So when the person moves beyond capacity to make those decisions, it's already done. Right, it's kind of, um, that's where you're dealing with uh, elder law attorneys. It could be a state, right, planning attorneys. Sure having all your insurances in place, you know, and uh, it's called uh, extended care planning because, but most people know it as long-term care insurance, but when you say long-term care insurance, they're thinking of a nursing home, right? But the the reality is it keeps you out of nursing homes um, and it, Mm -hmm. you know, takes away the emotional, physical, financial burden off families. Um, But it's getting back to what you were just talking about. You know, it's all that planning ahead of time. Yeah. Right. Um, It's a gift you give your families when you have those decisions made and your plans in place. Is there a a test, a smell test or not? Have you heard anything on that? Because it seemed like I did a year or two years ago and... Um, I just always recall, is there something like that? Yeah, 
there is. Um, it used to be called the peanut butter test, if, if I'm recalling. Peanut butter. Where you can pick up the <laughs> smell of peanut butter from three feet away. and But your senses get affected, too, by this disease. And we know that your, your taste becomes, your taste buds become affected. And when individuals are not able to pick up on some of the savory. Uh, that's why we see a lot of excess of salt use or the consumption of sweets because they can taste them but not being able to judge how much is too much or it becomes the the primary meal is, let's have ice cream i mean it doesn't sound all too bad but every day would probably be a good decision so there was a peanut butter test that's correct there may be other tests that that have is it also, jiffy or is it 100 uh, percent peanuts <laughs> what is it it's not a brand test no <laughs> Just the distinct smell uh, of yeah, because I think you got to watch. It gets back to what kind of yeah, we're peanut not butter is anybody, that? Right? <laughs> no, right. All right. You know, uh, you had mentioned the newest medication. Um, yes. So, are the is that is that out in the market, or is it uh, right now, today, or is there a few of them out there? I don't really hear a lot, and I try not to plug into TV a lot unless I'm watching The Voice or something that's gonna make sense to me. Uh, but but um, is there um, different meds, medications that are people taking right now that are proficient, and is it cost effective, or what do you have to do to get that medication? That's a loaded question of questions, yeah. Dennis. So I'm going to try and address it in, in a way that answers it on a, a, a global scale. I appreciate At the that. international conference that was held uh, for the Alzheimer's Association in July of mm-hmm. this year, a new drug was presented, and it has been FDA approved. As I mentioned, it's denanumab. Uh, we also have uh, Lakembi, which was the prior drug that is still being prescribed for Alzheimer's disease. And there are some prerequisites that you have to be in the early stage. You have to have biomarkers that Mm -hmm. indicate that you have (coughs) Alzheimer's disease. And there is genetic testing that is also a requirement. And they will do some uh, imaging of the brain to make sure that there is no side effects because with any medication, there can be risks, and we want to make sure that the the benefits outweigh the risks. So there is a lot of monitoring. It is an infusion-type drug right now, so it's not in tablet form. But our newest drug, it is an infusion that is monthly. Mm. Our Lakembi that was the prior shining star was infusion or is infusion for every two weeks. So we're moving forward in our development. I mean, scientists all over the world come together and share their successes and their trials. And there's never a failed trial because it'll tell you something. Something didn't work or try it a different way. So there's good data there. Physicians are prescribing, but you have to pre-qualify. And yeah. that's where your early detection is so yeah. very important. That's where you were talking where it has to be in early stages or you Correct. won't qualify? Correct. It's not proven at this point that mm-hmm. it would have a, make a difference in individuals that have moved on into the middle and the late stages of Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, this particular medication is focused on Alzheimer's disease, not other dementias at this time. But that doesn't mean that research as we speak, it may be announcing something that is targeted on another type of dementia, such as a Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's dementia. Research is always being conducted. Does Michael Fox, I know he has Parkinson's. Yes. Does he, he doesn't have anything to do with the dementia side, or does he? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, he still is very, avi- he's an advocate. Yeah, he's I think in the he's amazing. Eye. What a and guy, man. Every individual, and this is a great time to just bring that forward, every individual on this journey is the individual. There are no two individual experiences that can be universal for for care, for understanding, because every person is their own person with their personality. So they're going to interact with their disease differently. That's why that person-centered approach 
making sure that we are focusing just on that person and how they are experiencing their disease rather than trying to have one size fits all. Right. So, um, you know, we're going to be wrapping it up here. So if you can take that holistic approach um, sooner than later, and it's always a good time, and using all the expertise with these new prescriptions that are coming out, right, the forefront and getting support and being knowing where you can get it, like the Alzheimer's Association or if you're in Michigan. So if people had, and I know you gave out the number earlier, but just if people had questions, Deborah Ross, please uh, tell them how they, where they could maybe start. It could be starting with you or the Alzheimer's Association, and um, that would be great. Sure. I am so proud to be of the Alzheimer's Association, they are your biggest resource. And as we talked about earlier, nationwide, alz.org, six simple letters, that's our website. And we have a search bar in there. You can type in community resource finder. It'll ask for a zip code and it'll open up a number of resources available in that demographics. And don't forget our 800 number, 272-3900. Master clinicians, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, are available to help. And help can be customized to to what you're calling about, but know that they're there to help and guide and connect. Those are the two biggest resources that we have. We partner with the AARP. Um, Ageway is the former area agency on aging. We partner with them as well. But that's just here in Michigan. We have great resources across our great nation. So tap in, call up, find a support group so you never feel alone. And we have a number of support groups across our counties for times and locations for needs. So Deborah Ross, you are amazing. Thank you so much. You had blessed a lot of people with your background and how you in how you are all about helping people in the community when they're when they need the support so thank you for your gifts and may this audience continue to follow ensuring your well-being and god bless make it a blessed day thanks dennis